church for the privilege of being able to come before you and share a few of my thoughts in the message today on that passage that Lexi shared with us. Um, so I'll uh, just set this up. The thorn and the restless. I'll, um, I'll just open in prayer before we start. Lord, we thank you for our time together today. We thank you that we have the freedom to study your word, learn more about you and each other. We ask that you continue to be gracious with us as we walk our journeys of faith, individually and collectively, and as we seek to imitate Christ in all that we do. In your mighty name, amen. Okay. Now, if you've been a part of this church or been around me long enough, you'd be aware that much of my inspiration for preparing to speak with you from this very platform arises from the mundane and everyday things that remind me of scriptural truths. And over the past year or so, you might recall you've heard me speak about sheep and goats or stress and anxiety, uh, contentment, dwelling on, on these things that come out of my day to day. Well, I'm not going to break that pattern. It's no surprise that uh, it continues today in the subject. So it's not particularly obvious to anyone as I stand right here, but I've sustained an injury. There's no bandages or plaster casts, but at best, at best it's a nuisance and at worst it's debilitating. Last weekend, we spent a few days over at Lake Hume. We were skiing with my brother's family. And like any 40-something-year-old male, I there was no way that I was going to let the teenagers have all the fun. So I turned back the clock and got up on the skis and the tube and had a great time. But long story short, in getting up and falling off multiple times, I've somehow ended up with quite a degree of bruising in my ribs. Could be broken, I don't know. Uh, I probably should see a doctor. I don't know. James, do you know a good one? So. <laughs> uh, it's been commented to me that it's probably an old man injury and it's hard to disagree. Unfortunately, there's no hero story behind it. It's not as if I was saving a mother and her baby from a burning house. No, I was just getting older and not as athletic as I used to be. And it doesn't garner me a lot of sympathy, but it's been a thorn in my side, quite literally, over this past week and a half. Every movement causes a jab of pain. Even the simple act of breathing causes a level of minor discomfort, and hence the restless in the title. But I don't regale you with my ailments just to gain your pity. Moreover, it's just to illustrate that it's given me plenty to consider about this passage and Paul's thorn in his side. You might recall I spoke briefly about this in a communion devotion some months ago, uh, again about a minor ailment of mine with a splinter in my finger. And uh, what is it with, with these injuries? Maybe there's a pattern forming uh, in the uh, material I'm drawing on to speak to you about. But the physical pain of that splinter and even of bruised ribs is a constant reminder. It's very difficult to ignore and sometimes it's all consuming, which I guess leads us to this passage. It's a chunky passage. It's rich in meaning and it delves into the mega topic of why does God allow suffering? And of course, there's entire libraries written on that topic. We won't get through all of that today, and I'm certainly not qualified enough to speak into that with too much authority. And even the last verse in, in, in the passage, for when I am weak, then I am strong, it's, it's often quoted, but on face value, it actually doesn't make any sense. It's self-contradictory. So how are we to understand it? And we don't even know what the thorn is. Paul's response to his thorn was it physical, as I've alluded to in my own experience? Or was it mental, like depression? Was he being persecuted? We don't know. We aren't told what it is. Paul doesn't describe it because apparently the Corinthians were well familiar with whatever it was. 
we can't be certain, but indeed we can all agree that it had a much more spiritual aspect. It's clearly an area of weakness that Paul knew he was vulnerable to, and it caused him considerable annoyance. He prayed time and again for God to take it away, but God had different plans. I've prepared a bit of a breakdown here of the four major elements of the passage. As you can see, it's very colourful. Uh, but the idea is just to show you the four sections that we're going to go through in a bit more detail today around Paul's amazing experience, his purposeful suffering, his prayer to take it away, and then a new perspective. God's view was that it was better for Paul to retain the thorn, whatever it was, and instead to rely entirely on God. My grace is sufficient for you, he said. Despite Paul's role in establishing and leading the early church, he was kept grounded by the reality that he's still broken and still sinful and he's still a human who can take no credit for the things of God and for the ultimate spread of the gospel. His weakness was simply proof that the power of God and the message of grace was not his own, but the power of Christ in him. But let's uh, jump into those four main parts. How do we understand God and suffering? One of the great questions that every Christian will face, even non-Christians, why do bad things happen to seemingly good people? Reconciling suffering and God is hard for Christians to grapple with. And to the Corinthian Christians, it was a big issue. For them, they could not understand how a true apostle of Jesus could suffer to the degree that Paul was. This caused Paul's critics to consider him to be an inferior apostle. But rather than deflect his sufferings, Paul magnified them. He proclaimed, if I must boast, I will boast in the things that show my weakness. The apostle Paul laid out his trump card of his suffering. But he didn't do that to elevate himself, but to express why suffering should never be considered a reason to dismiss a person as a true servant of Christ. Paul had an amazing experience and he spoke in verses 1 to 6 of a Christian that he knew from 14 years prior that was caught up to the third heaven into paradise. Now, the Ancient writings describe the different heavens uh, in, th in three ways. They spoke of the sky, the clouds, our atmosphere as the first heaven. They described the planets, space, moon, stars as the second heaven and where God resides as the third. So that's what the reference to the third heaven. Paul also called it paradise because that's where God is. Now, Paul didn't know if it was just a vision or whether he was actually caught up into paradise, into the presence of God, but he heard things that people aren't permitted to speak. He made it clear in verses 5 and 6 that he was talking about himself. But he's not going to boast about that, even though what he would be saying would be the truth. He says in verse 6, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. The incredible experience of being allowed entry into paradise, into heaven, could easily have led to an overinflation of his ego, making him feel rather superior to others, less blessed. He is an apostle, but he didn't want others to think of him in an improper way. He did not want to talk about the things that he had seen or experienced. Actually, he wanted people to look at his godly life and his proclamation of the gospel instead. He wasn't there to wow them with his personal experiences. And we do see that from time to time in Christians who, who, who don't do that, who don't follow Paul's lead. They want to set themselves up as special and distinct, and they tell of all the stories and visions and dreams that they claim that God has given them in order to elevate themselves um, over others um, to impress them. 
the and I guess uh, Paul says that he doesn't do this. He doesn't use those things to get people to listen to him, even though he could have easily truthfully shared those. They're not the point. His faithful life and his faithful proclamation of the gospel is what he wants people to see. And look, I'll be honest and tell you that from time to time, you know, having the privilege of being come and stand here and, and talk to you all gives me a little puff of pride. Uh, but it's human nature and we like to think more highly of ourselves than we should. However, as soon as that thought arrives, I have to chastise myself, reminding myself to be more like Paul and to remind myself that my, my weak efforts and never a source of pride, but at best, all they do is provide a signpost for others toward Christ. So let's look into purposeful suffering. Where are we? I'll just, uh... oh, here we are. So what Paul says next is highly instructive about how God runs the world. In verse 7 of our passage today, Paul says, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Notice the purpose to which the suffering that Paul is experiencing. He actually says it twice to labour the point. So to keep me from becoming conceited, that's the purpose of God. Now, we can see two angles at, in what Paul is going through. The thorn in his flesh is a messenger of Satan that is tormenting him. Satan uses trials, sufferings and difficulties to torment us, to harass us and trouble us. And it's what we see in the book of Job as well. God allows or uses Satan to purge evil from the church just quickly, I'll draw your attention to these three other examples. In 1 Corinthians, you can see there where Paul is responding to sexual immorality in the church, where he's delivering the evildoers over to Satan. In 1 Timothy, similarly with the false teachers, uh, and as I mentioned in Job, his faith was extensively tested and God allowed it to happen. So it's thoroughly intriguing and it's paradoxical in many ways in that God allows Satan to do his thing. Satan thinks he's winning, but in doing so, God is using it to achieve his purposes to further the growth of the church and the faithful. But notice that it's not God's purpose to torment Paul. It's not God's purpose to harass Job. He has another purpose. Paul says that for him, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations and visions that he's received, the thorn in his flesh was given to him uh, so that he would not exalt himself or become conceited or prideful or full of himself, I guess. God wanted Paul to remain humble and fully aware of his own weakness. And a message that we consistently see in the scriptures is that God allows suffering purposefully. He allows it so that his purpose and good would be fulfilled in us. However, Satan uses suffering to torment, harass, and in an attempt to destroy us. So trying to isolate these incidents as an exclusive work of either Satan or of God is actually quite difficult. And we often see in the scriptures that it's both. Even the cross of Jesus was both. It's the pinnacle example. Revelation 12 reveals that Satan was using temptations of the cross to try and destroy Christ at the same time that God was using the cross to save the world. Luke 22 talks about the time of death when darkness reigned. The apostles preached that Jesus was killed at the hands of wicked men, but at the same time they spoke of the cross being the work of God. It is really important to notice that God isn't coming in after the fact and turning around something for our good 
or he's not coming in after the fact and cleaning up after Satan. It's not really the purpose of these, the scriptures. God has a purpose from the beginning. So he allows that suffering to occur with his purposes in mind, even though Satan's acting with his own agenda and purposes, but let's not lose sight of the fact that God has ultimate control. I mentioned earlier about the uncertainty and what Paul's thorn in his flesh might be, but could it be so intentional to be vague about it that it allows others, anybody who's reading his letters or, uh, or indeed us, to identify with our own personal thorns. God, we can identify with Paul's experience and to appropriate the lesson that he's putting forward into our own faith. Our thorn in the flesh is not good, but at the same time, it's also not bad because it can convey a word from God. And what is important to both Paul and to us is that the thorn in our flesh, the sore ribs, is a constant reminder of God's grace and a constant reminder of God's power working through us. Paul prayed repeatedly for God to take it away. He pleaded uh, with God to take it away. Jesus even pleaded with God to take the cup from him. And as we think more about that, we can see that God told Paul no to his prayer repeatedly. God told his apostles no. He even said no to Jesus. Paul's weaknesses are probably beyond our own experiences, but if we live long enough, we will suffer our own weaknesses as we serve our Lord Jesus. And I'm sure, you know, in your own minds, you could probably name some struggles that you're experiencing right now. Our requests for physical peace and rest often receive an answer of no from, from God. We ask the question and God says no. My ribs still hurt, even though I've asked God to take it away. And Julian and I have always said, if we asked our children a question such as, are you able to clean your room? Despite the fact that we want the answer to be yes, no is an equally valid answer. And children work this out really quickly. <laughs> and we also learn just as quickly that if there's only one valid response, don't give them a choice. So back to the topic, what should we make of the fact that God says no and he allows suffering to continue? But Paul tells us of God's intention toward him when God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. God has given us sufficient grace to endure. Notice that the answer is not that the suffering would be removed, Rather, God has given us enough grace that we are able to endure through it. Now, do you really believe that? Do I really believe that? It's a, it is a difficult, difficult thing to understand and to really fathom when you're in the midst of suffering. And I know that. And it's really, it's a very hard thing to believe and to remind ourselves of when you're in the pit of it. But God says we, he's given us what we need for this life, that we have what we need to endure, to excel and to flourish as disciples of Christ. We have God's grace to cope with the weaknesses that he's not taking away, that he's allowing us to, to face. But the rest of that verse, verse 9, is, is equally staggering. For my power is made perfect in weakness, he says. So it's when we are finally out of strength, when we've reached our limit, that we finally depend on God the most. We can only go so far, and God takes it the rest of the way. Our power is limited, our effort is weak, and God takes over from there. When we can only do very little because of our weaknesses, then clearly God is glorified when great things are achieved. Suffering is there to burn away our pride, our self-confidence and independence. Therefore, we embrace the suffering given to us because we have been given God's grace 
which is sufficient to endure and indeed quite necessary for the growth of our faith. That's a really important point that God takes weak people to show his strength because those weak people depend on God, not on themselves. And we see it over and over through the Bible, and I really appreciate your children's talk, Ros, um, mentioning Gideon, because Gideon wasn't a hero. God is the hero who took a fearful Gideon and made him victorious, and it was obvious to all that it could have only have been achieved through God's power. Moses was similar, an exiled shepherd who became the, the deliverer of Israel out of Egypt. And David was an insignificant shepherd who ended up king of Israel and father to the king of kings. It's in our weaknesses that allows God's power to be put on display. This means we need to think about life and ourselves in a completely new way. As per the last two verses of our passage, a new life perspective. Therefore, these, this is verses 9 and 10, therefore I'll boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Uh, I'll ask for the sound, please, Mitch. I've got a short video here that I'd like to show. And hopefully it... Um... So let me ask you a question right off the bat. What do you think your greatest strengths as a manager? Why don't I tell you what my greatest weaknesses are? I work too hard, I care too much, and sometimes I can be too invested in my job. Okay. And your strengths? Well, my weaknesses are actually strengths. Oh. Yes. Very good. There you go. Very good. Now. That's rather amusing, and he's turned that around to make himself look rather great. But quite unlike our friend Michael Scott from The Office, Paul was thrilled to make a pageant of his weaknesses to reveal not his strength like Michael Scott did, but his utter dependence on God. Paul is compelled to boast of his weaknesses. He refused to boast about his ecstatic experiences of being caught up to heaven. Rather, he wanted to boast about God's tough mercy of allowing, through Satan, allowing a thorn that prevented him from stroking his pride. God, sorry, Christ's power is made perfect by finishing its work of humbling Paul to depend on him. In other words, Christ's power is most evident when Paul's weakness is most evident. And it becomes a spectacle of Christ's all-sufficient grace. And since weaknesses give occasion for Christ's power to be displayed, Paul takes pleasure in them. He actually takes delight in them. The idea is even stronger than this. The translation often uses the word content, which is means to accept it. Uh, but in other translations, uh, it's actually the same word as from the Greek, as being well pleased or delight in. So it's the same word in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, when God talks from heaven at the baptism of Jesus, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. It's the same Greek word. So the NIV renders verse 10 as I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. And other translations read, I take pleasure in them not just to be content with it, to just accept it as part of life, actually to celebrate it. So I guess we need these things to, so that we depend on God. If God did not allow us to experience these failures, sufferings and difficulties, we would never rely on him. 
we would continue to think about how great we are and how much we're in control over our own lives. It's in our weakness and frailty that we surrender our will to God. And some of us who have made it through incredible trials, I'm sure, could say that it was only through what was only possible by the power of God. God gives us strength at the right time when we need it, sending people and help at the right time when we need it. Therefore, we can be content, we can delight, and we can take pleasure in weaknesses and sufferings because we know that God is at work and that his power is on display. Thus, we learn something really, really valuable. Focusing all our efforts on removing the difficulties or removing the suffering or removing the painful ribs is not the goal. Rather, we can look at the trials and do exactly what James told us to do in this verse, where we count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So as we wrap this up and we conclude the message, I guess I ask the question, what is the thorn that God is allowing you to experience to keep you from conceit, from pride and arrogance that allows his power to be put on display? And how is that working within you and working toward your faith and your eternal salvation? As difficult as it is and or as crazy as it sounds, we have to embrace suffering. We've been given the grace of God and the suffering is necessary for our faith. None of us are lacking what we need to remain faithful to God and to flourish through our sufferings. God promised us that his grace is sufficient for us. Jesus suffered and prayed three times and had to accept God's answer. Paul suffered, prayed three times, and had to accept God's answer. So we must also, in our suffering, from time to time, we pray, but we accept God's answer, whatever it might be. Like nearly everything in the Christian faith, embracing or celebrating weakness contrasts directly with the world around us. Pride in the strength of our own abilities or successes is what the secular world values. But we are different, as we know. God's divine power is ideally displayed through human weakness. And any achievements that occur in spite of that weakness reveal the divine source. As Christians, just like Paul, knowing our weaknesses and relying on God entirely serves us well in maintaining our humility. So to finish... I've spoken at length about having sore ribs and let's not go on too much more about that. But I mentioned about how it's an old man injury. So let's, perhaps as we close, we can remember this acronym. OLD, old. Own our weaknesses. The antidote to pride is to submit to God's will through utter reliance and dependence on him in much the same way that infants rely on their parents. We live in our weaknesses. There's no school like the old school of suffering that teaches us to live in the, our weaknesses. For the affliction of said weaknesses causes us to boldly cry out to God for help. And as we explored before, we delight in our weaknesses because as we boldly cry out to God for help, we anticipate the day when God doesn't say no, but he says yes. And though he may not answer the prayers as we would hope or we would like in this life, he will certainly answer them beyond our wildest dreams at the resurrection because of his immeasurable grace toward us. And it's this praise in anticipation of that that enables us to delight in our weaknesses and sufferings because we're praising God for his power, his strength and his victory, which has already been won and it's ours to share in. As we read in 1 Corinthians to close, chapter 15, 
death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Damon. Thank you.